AP Biology, Chapter 22, Evolution, Part 5. When we left off, we talked about analogous structures and how they are the result of convergent evolution. They are the same function, like the bird wings and uh, insect wings. However, they don't have internal structures that are the same, and they have no close evolutionary relationship. They are distantly related. If the organism has a lot of similarities as far as bone structures, then that implies similar DNA sequences that have changed very little over time, and those are closer relationships. Uh, that's homologous structures. However, they do not have to have the same function. Now, in parallel evolution, we have convergent evolution in uh, common areas, common biomes, common uh, environments. Here we have the sugar glider. That's a marsupial mammal. Marsupials have a pouch. Think kangaroos. Uh, placental mammals did not evolve on Australia. There are no native placental mammals. In North America, we have flying squirrels, and we have placental mammals, animals with an umbilical cord and a uterus where development takes place uh, with a placenta. So with parallel evolution, we have similar um, analogous structures. We have the skin forming between the forelimbs and the rear legs of uh, marsupial sugar gliders, and we have the same thing going on with flying squirrels. However, the question would have, you'd have to ask is, why don't we have the same type of animal in the same environments? Why don't we have flying squirrels that are placental if they are uh, usually able to outcompete marsupials in Australia? The answer has to do with Pangaea. When Pangaea uh, split up about the time the dinosaurs went extinct, Australia had on it trapped uh, some mammals, marsupial mammals and monotremes. And those uh, mammals evolved over time, but the placenta, or the umbilical cord attached to a nutrient-rich uh, internal lining of the uterus, never evolved in the animals that were trapped in Australia. So in Australia, we have the pouches, uh, the marsupials, and we have the monotremes, things like the platypus that lays eggs, but no placentals. Now, evolutionary theory would explain this, because if the Australian continent trapped animals and they evolved independent of the North and South American animals, as well as Asia, then they would expect to be have differences that, uh, that are um, unique to the Australian continent, and that's what we find. When placental mammals do come to Australia, they outcompete the Australian animals. We have parallel types across continents in similar biomes. We have the placental mammals on North and South America, and then we have the Australian marsupials, which have similar features, analogous structures, result of a differing uh, mutation pathway that led to these structures like uh, thicker um, claws on the front legs for burrowing. We have uh, anteaters and the marsupial cousin to the anteaters. Basically similar structures in both these animals, even though they're not really clo very closely related. All right, vestigial organs. Vestigial means leftover or uh, non-functional. They don't have any uh, um, survival benefit in the modern organism. Or the survival benefit is uh, outweighed by the disadvantage for having these structures. So some modern animals have structures that have little or no function. The remnants of structures that were functional in the ancestral species. And mutations to these structures uh, accumulate into genes without reducing fitness. And I'll give you an example in a second. Here we have the, uh, the lost eyes of the blind cavefish. We have the vestigial eyes. You still have the indentation where the eyes were. The blind cavefish lives in caves, as the name implies. However, in a cave, there's no light, so there's no survival advantage to having uh, eyes. Now, we're not talking Lamarckian statements here. We're not saying that the fish didn't use their eyes, so they just kind of disappeared on their own. What we're saying is that the mutations that destroyed the proteins to make it an eyeball did not have a negative effect on the fish's survival. So any mutations that uh, result in the eye not forming are still passed on because they don't reduce fitness or reduce the ability of the fish to survive and reproduce. So over time, we have a fish that has the, the indentation where the eyes used to be, but no functioning eyes as a result of mutations that accumulated that, um, that didn't hurt its survival. Remember, it's not just due to disuse, it's due to mutations that didn't have an effect on the organism's survival or reproduction. Snakes and whales also have the remains of pelvis and leg bones of their walking ancestors that they evolved from. 
And the human tailbone isn't one bone. It's four fused vertebra of what probably was once a tail in our ancestors. Here we have the vestigial uh, structures on a uh, whale. Some whales still have the femur as well as the hip bones that um, are located within the whale, yet there are no legs that they're attached to. So these are the remnants of the legs of the ancestors they evolved from, and we have those fossils. The fossils of the ancestors whales have the more fully developed back legs that are fins. However, um, as the as you might guess, there is more of a survival advantage to be in streamlined than not streamlined. However, once these bones are inside the body of the whale, it's not really a negative as much. So these things, um, even though there's mutations that result in the bones not forming as well, uh, they still don't really reduce the fitness of a whale because if you notice the whale's shape, it's still streamlined because the bones are on the inside of the body. And snakes uh, also evolved from a four-legged animal in the past. And snakes still have some of the features of their ancestors. They have uh, hind limbs, limbs the, the uh, femur, as well as the uh, uh, pelvis uh, inside the animal. And sometimes snakes are still born with some vestigial uh, remnants of those rear legs. And uh, if you can kind of think of the survival advantage of not having rear legs, well, think about what snakes eat. They eat mice and other animals that live in holes in the ground. With smaller legs or no legs, you're able to get at your food more effectively because you don't have those legs getting in the way of getting into those holes, and that provides a survival advantage. You can more effectively chase animals if you uh, down holes if you don't have legs. And then human vestigial structures, the appendix. The appendix has some lymphatic tissue in it. It was thought to have some immune function, kind of like our tonsils. However, the appendix has a negative cost to our survival. It uh, is at the junction between the large intestine here and the small intestine. If the survival disadvantage is greater than the advantage, then it's still considered a vestigial structure, so it doesn't have to be completely useless. The appendix sometimes traps little uh, bacteria from your large intestine, the nastiness in, their, uh, in your feces. And if that appendix uh, traps those bacterial, uh, that bacteria, gases start to get produced, and it starts to get inflamed. In that case, you have something called appendicitis. If you take a look at this person here, it's on the right-hand side. So if you ever experience a sharp pain on the right-hand side of your body, it might be appendicitis or an inflammation of the appendix. If this appendix bursts, it will release the bacteria, and that is lethal to the person um, with a burst appendix. So not much of a survival advantage having the appendix, even if there is a little bit of lymphatic tissue there, and it's considered vestigial. Our human tailbone is not one bone, as you would expect from just a thing that looks like one bone. It's actually four fused vertebrae together, and we think these four fused vertebrae were the same vertebrae in the tails of, uh, of our ancestors, and they do match up with the, uh, the bones of animals with tails. So our tailbone and the appendix are human vestigial structures, remnants from a different time. At this time, we'll get some notes. Vestigial structures, structures that had function in ancestors, but modern organisms have a negative or nurse, no survival value. Mutations to structures may result in the structures not forming fully, but are not lost to disuse. That's Lamarckian. For example, we have the vestigial eyes on the blind cavefish, femur on some whales and snakes, and the human appendix. Pause at this time if you need to copy these down. Move it up a little bit. Here we have the appendix hanging off the intestine. Comparative embryology. It's a video on this. Animals that have similar, um, a common ancestor also have similar developmental patterns. They just modify those structures that develop during embryological development over time as a result of mutations unique to those species. For example, fish, and reptiles, birds, and humans all have fish as ancestors, and fish have uh, gill pouches. Now, mutations to reptiles, birds, and humans have converted that gill pouch into other structures like the lower jaw and uh, inner ear. However, we all form these kind of same structures at early stages of development because we have a shared common ancestry that developed those structures. Here we have the gill pouch of a fish, a reptile, 
bird and human. And of course, they don't uh, evolve into gills anymore. All right, we're going to pause at this point and get some more notes. Now, we talked about this a little bit with parallel evolution. This is biogeography. Animals and plants distributed based on adaptations of ancestral populations, like the marsupials in Australia, not what is it, the best animal for a biome. It would actually be better to be a placental animal in Australia. Whenever placental animals come to Australia, they outcompete the native marsupial animals, and uh, that's a problem for those marsupials. Right now, we have like tons of rabbits in Australia that are placental mammals from North and South America when humans brought them over, and they are replacing a lot of marsupial native species. So in evolutionary theory, we would explain this as trapped populations evolved independent of the source population it came from. And we think that Australia moved away with tectonic plates uh, over 60 million years ago during uh, the split up of Pangaea. Here we have flying squirrels that are placental with an umbilical cord that are found in North and South America. Comparative embryology, development before birth is embryology. Closely related species have the same starting point during embryological development. Now by close, this is um, not super close. We're talking uh, a long time ago. Mutations unique to each species will result in different structures they will become. Similar development means more recent common ancestor. For example, gill pouch, turtles, humans. However, in humans, that gill pouch becomes the ear and lower jaw. Okay, moving on. Now, the molecular record is the last piece of evidence we're going to talk about supporting evolution, and it's the best uh, evidence supporting evolution, and it was unknown to Darwin at his time. Remember that all life has the same genetic code of DNA and RNA. We can also compare the genes for important proteins. Uh, for example, cytochrome C and cell respiration. A lot of organisms have that cell respiration, so that's a conserved gene uh, that hasn't been changed very much over hundreds of millions of years. If it was like a gene for an ear or hair or something like that, that could be wildly different between different species that are not closely related. Hemoglobin is the protein that carries oxygen, and uh, oxygen carrying is important to a lot of animals. So hemoglobin is another um, amino acid sequence. A protein is an amino acid sequence that we can analyze. So we have uh, millions of years ago at the bottom here, that's kind of cut off, and the um, nucleotide substitutions between um, different organisms. Let's get a better example. So comparing hemoglobin, hemoglobin compared from human to other humans, well, there's zero differences in the amino acid sequence. Between humans and macaw monkeys, they, there's eight amino acids different in the thousands of amino acids in hemoglobin that are different. In dogs, we have more differences in amino acids, the result of more mutations to DNA to the hemoglobin molecule over time. More time separating the species, more mutations, more differences in some of these important molecules like hemoglobin. And in lampreys, there's 125 amino acid differences between us and them, and that would show a more, more distant relationship to lampreys than to, to macaws. This is how DNA evidence kind of supports the homologous, homologous structures and things like that. All this stuff kind of ties together. So if we compare you to your immediate family, of course your DNA sequences are very similar, um, and you're related, very closely related, within 20 years. Your extended family, a little more distantly related, still very similar. Even the human race has basically the same uh, DNA, over 99.9%. .9%. And we are very close related to each other over to, uh, from about 200,000 years ago. 100,000 years ago, we have modern humans. Other primates are 95 to 98% similar. We have many similar traits, like nails and flat faces and opposable thumbs. However, we have a more distant relationship with those other primates. About 10 million years ago is when we split off from them. Other mammals, we still have a lot of similarities. We have hair, warm-blooded, four-chambered heart, things like that. And uh, we have a more distant common ancestor with them and more different DNA. Other animals like reptiles, birds, we still share well, some things in common. And uh, 
we have a more distant relationship with them. Pause at this time to get your notes on the sixth evidence for evolution. Go ahead and pause. And the last thing we have notes on is uh, how this works. Source population 100% in common. They split. Now there's mutations not passed on, 98% in common. If this population splits again, they'll be closer related, more DNA in common, than population A.